Hello and good evening, friends. Welcome to ACNS webinars. After successfully completing our special editions of web webinars in the month of November, we are back to our regular webinars. And today is the first talk in the master series of ACNS webinars in the month of December. And we have two great speakers waiting to deliver their respective talks for you. The first speaker for today is Professor Takeyu Taki from Japan. Professor Taki is the director of neurosurgery at Kansai Rosai Hospital, Hyogo, Japan. He did his graduation from Yamaguchi University Graduate School of Medicine. He was previously working in the Department of Neurosurgery, Osaka City University Faculty of Medicine. He is a very prominent member of the Japanese Neurosurgical Society. And today he is going to share his vast experience about uh, uh, using exoscope during neurosurgery in his talk titled Neurosurgery 3.0. We are so thankful to him for accepting our invitation to be a speaker at our webinars. The second speaker for today is a very prominent faculty from the Chinese Neurosurgical Society. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Professor Lu Miking, who is the chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery, Shanghai General Hospital. Professor Lu is engaged in neurosurgical work for the last 29 years and is highly skilled in microscopic and endoscopic minimally invasive techniques. His specialties include skull-based tumors, neuro-oncology, spinal diseases, cerebrovascular diseases, etc. So far, he has performed approximately 7,000 surgeries, uh, which includes pituitary tumor, acoustic schwannomas, and brain stem lesions. We are so thankful to Professor Lu Mi King for accepting our invitation to be a speaker at our webinars. Today, he is going to talk about his experience in normalizing growth hormone levels through open and endoscopic techniques. The chair for today is one of my dearest friend, Professor Alberto Felitti. Professor Felitti is a faculty at the Department of Neurosurgery, Division of Biomedicine and Movement Sciences, University of Verona, Italy. He is the president of the Fujita Alumni Association and has been a great supporter for the educational initiatives of the ACNS. Professor Felitti is an expert in the field of minimally invasive surgery, especially for pituitary tumors. We are so glad to have him today to chair this webinar. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yopokato, I would like to welcome today's speakers, Professor Taki Utaki, as well as Professor Lou Meeking, and also the Chair, Professor Alberto Felitti, to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Liu Boon Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And with that introduction, may I please hand over the proceedings to Professor Alberto Felitti. So we are joined by Professor Zubin, our great support from China. Welcome, Professor Zubin. Oh, you're we are, fine. Thank we you. are lucky. We are lucky today because we have uh, many, many experts uh, uh, here uh, connected. So I think uh, uh, discussion at the end of our speech would be very, very useful and very intriguing for all of us. So I want to thank uh, the organizers of this educational webinar. Uh, to invite me uh, to chair this session. Uh, I, am, I, I still consider myself a young neurosurgeon, so uh, I am here to chair, but first of all, I am here to learn from these two experts uh, in their fields. I think we should, uh, we should start immediately with the first uh, talk uh, by Professor Taki. Uh, he's gonna talk about a very uh, uh, interesting topic and up-to-date technology. So please, Professor Taki, you can start your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for your kind introduction. Thank you very much for taking time, Professor Albert Fletti. And thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you today. I'm Taki Taki, Director of Neurosurgery, Cancer Rosai Hospital, Japan. I am here to talk about new style of neurosurgicals neurological surgery, neurosurgery version three. It is an introduction to exoscopic surgery. Modern neurosurgery was started in the 1900s by Dr. Harvey Cushing and Dr. Walter Dandy and others. In the 1950s, with the invitation of the surgical microscope, neurosurgical operation has made great strides. On the other hand, on the other hand, general surgery has long been abdominal open surgery on the direct vision. But in the latter half of the 20th century, it shifted to laparoscopic or thoracoscopic surgery. And now 
robotic surgery has been introduced. It is time for neurosurgery to enter a new era. Modern neurosurgery were started in the 19th and the 1900s uh, uh, by Dr. Harvey Cushing and Dr. Walter Dandy and others. In the 1950s, with the invention of the surgical microscope, neurosurgical operation has made great strides. On the other hand, general surgery has been abdominal open surgery under direct vision. But in the latter half of the 20th century, it shifted to laparoscopic or thoracoscopic surgery. And now robotic surgery has Sorry. Robotic surgery has long been, uh, tracking, uh, robotic surgery has been introduced. It is time for neurosurgery to enter a new era. You will find numerous publications of the exoscope from the last 10 years on the internet. I am pleased to introduce an exoscope the override digital camera system. Yeah, the exoscopic surgery is a style that you operate at hand while looking at the monitor. Just a computer game, uh, just a, a computer role playing game. The Olympus recommended that the camera head is installed near the operator's line of sight in this way. However, I don't think this situation will take full advantage of the exoscope. The overall camera sy system I have been using for two years now. You can see that it covers the surgery that the general neurosurgeon experiences. Uh, Two more operations, two more surgery, uh, malignancy and benign, and uh, vascular surgery, and is mud creeping and anastomosis, and many kinds of surgery. When I produce, uh, I perform the end nasal approach, I used both end, uh, endoscope and exoscope. Then, zero degree exoscope and seven degree end, uh, endoscope I use. Whenever I introduce an exoscope, I'm asked, can you achieve same performance as microscopic surgery? Then I answer, of course, and more performance you will get. Now that I have started using the exoscope, I performed the over 99% operation in the supine position. I will show you the first case here. She admitted our institute by ambulance and quickly unconsciousness. So I decided to undergo emergency operation. In this case, in this case, cerebral hemorrhage, many neurosurgeons adopt the lateral obliquer or a prone position, I think. Hematoma are often located relatively close, relatively close to the upper surface of the cerebellum. And I set the patient to the supine position, like half sitting position I named exosupine. The craniotomies are lateral supracerebral craniotomy that fully exposes the transverse sinus. The caudal side and not craniotomy to beyond the inferior nuchal line. Oh no. Yeah. Oh, sorry. First, yep. 
sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. The patient is positioned in the supine position with uh, neck flexion. Neck flexion. Just looking at her own novel uh, and fixed using the Sugita head frame. Uh, of course, the slight return to the opposite side. This position has uh, the advantage that it can be set with less manpower. And I imagine she and intracranial pressure can be reduced compared to the prone or the lateral position. This position is friendly to the operator, medical staff, and even anesthesiologist. And, and here, camera head is positioned fairly low and does not interfere with the patient's shoulder when viewed from the caudal side. In addition, the operator's hands are extremely close to the operative field here and allowing the use of short surgical instrument to facilitate the fine maneuver. It also does not interfere with the delivery of equipment to and from the scrub nurse here, here. First, ICD angiography is used to confirm the location of the transverse uh, sinus. Here, here is the transverse sinus. You can see the Yes, yeah, you can see the yellow adipose tissue here and find the surgical field is so shallow. From the video, don't you feel any discomfort when performing the intracerebellar hematoma removing procedure in the supine position or exoscopic surgery? Never, don't coagulate. The key point to surgery for intracerebral hematoma is how to avoid vascular damage without coagulation. Only suction, suction and irrigation as possible. Yeah, many vessels are healed. The camera head can be moved with the foot pedal. Irrigation and suction. And uh, this old focus, old focus. And last piece of hematoma and finished. You can see that the cerebrum has become struck. Uh, leaving enough space between the cerebrum and the tentorium to ensure effective decompression. I adopt the same approach to remove uh, the tumor at the same site here, here. Even though the same lesion has been treated gamma knife three times, it has increased so I decided operation. I perform the same posture and setting as in the previous case. All medical staff, all medical staff are ergonomically comfort, comfortable. Yeah, same approach and a sufficient brain subsidence can be achieved without intentional CF, CSF drainage or use of osmotic diuretic, diuretics here. 
this is the core of radiation necrosis. There are no viable tumor cells in, in it. Radiation necrosis shows the formation of such fine vessels. Coagulation and cut. Coagulation, coagulation and cut. And removed. Yeah, this is final view. This present approach is modification of the lateral infratentorial supracerebellar approach. This case, uh, sorry. This case, uh, yeah, sorry. This uh, approach is a good indication for a petrocribal region. This is a case of small meningioma here, small meningioma of 17 one year old female who developed trigeminal neuralgia here. This de depressed trigeminal and uh, uh, free from the tumor here. Please attention to two points. First, the head frame is a standard sita frame and not a special one for a sitting one position. The second point is the direction of the camera head here. When the detachment from the cerebral tentorium, it is an angle to looking up. And this angle and this, but this field of view is very, very difficult with microscope. By appro approaching the supracerebral intra uh, uh, tentorially, first I marked the transfer sinus here. Yes, this approach, tumor and torque now can be easily identified. Okay. Here is a toroquia and toroquia nerve and the tumor and the SCA. SCA and toroquia and the tumor uh, ambient system and turn to the lateral side, a petrol brain is you can identify. And here is a trigeminal nerve. There are only three points in Benin-Joma uh, surgery. Detachment, the nude of arcuate membrane and internal decompression. Now detach and detach and detach. Yeah. And then I remove the tumor around that fourth nerve, trochlear nerve, to keep the arachnoid intact. And then the, remove the tumor from the maker's cave. Yeah. 
the arachnoid is covered with trigeminal. And detached, detached. Here is a petrochlorobal junction. And uh, I remove the last two part of the tumor uh, around the trochlea, and this is the ventral end of the tumor. Here is the free edge of tentorium, and uh, yes, you can see here the ocular water, the third nerve here. to keep the arachnoid membrane. This is an important point. Horse nerve and acromotor nerve and uh, Trigeminal now. Here is an alacrant membrane around the trigeminal nerve and the nude and remove the last chip of the tumor from the maker's cave. and uh, removed, yes. This is the final view. Here is the uh, petrol vein and the uh, superior petrol sinus is here. Fifus and uh, third and sixth nerve and SCN and bridging vein here. The usual this uh, usual lateral subacute approach uh, is also performed in the supine position. It is so called the gravity depend dependent supine position. This is a 70 year old female with hydro uh, hydrocephalus. We utilize the uh, over table for all exoscopic surgery. This is over table. In this case, the region is on the left side and I am right-handed. So it will be a reverse move, reverse move, but it will not interfere with the delivery of the instrument. Okay. I will show, uh, I will show you two things first you will see the management of the internal auditory meatus. I try to perform a sharp dissection as possible and avoid brunt dissection as possible. The bottom of the bottom of the meatus and uh, I remove and cut with scissor, micro scissor. Yeah. 
digital, digital zoom is very useful. The end of the tumor and the vestibular nerve here. Uh, and I use a, a brain spatula here, but it's not retraction for use. It's only to protect the cerebrum. And next scene, next scene. Uh, the finest maneuver is required for the uh, strongest uh, adhesion from the facial nerve to entrance of the internal audit meters. Here. From here to here, the severs facial nerve. And this is the vestibular now, vestibular cochlear nerve, whitish, white vestibular now. And this is a fifth nerve and a sixth uh, abducens nerve here. Here is the dorsal skin nerve. Last piece of the tumor here. Here is a vestibular, vestibular cochlea here, and uh, and I trim the remaining tumor. Very small piece, but uh, cut and trimming. Here, here the normal vestibular. And this is the final view. Yeah, here's the trigeminal and the facial and the vestibular cochlear complex. Yeah. I familiar apply, familiar apply the combined approach for the relatively large tumor in the petrochrybal region. She admitted to an institute with a progressive facial policy for a year. The angle here, the angle at which the camera head looks up when the detaching from the tentorium is wonderful, I think. And uh, wow, oh, sorry. Wow, the major reason. Uh, uh, for ab adopting such a uh, position, ex supine, is to control breathing. As with uh, the sitting position, oozing is greatly suppressed and a clean surgical field is secured. It also improves venous return and reduces uh, venous pressure and also reduces venous damage. After confirming with ICD angiography here, this is the transverse sinus. A dural incision is made along the transverse sinus. Now this is a sigma sense of it. And here is the facial nerve. So here is the internal auditory meatus. 
and I detached between uh, the pet, uh, from the petrous bone between the internal auditor meatus and machial scale. The petrous vein are stretched but never uh, sacrificed here. This component compresses the facial nerve and causes the facial uh, palsy. She recovers the facial palsy within a week. Yeah. And next is the tentorial side. Here is the torque rear, torque rear nerve. And then I attacked to the macular scale to rescue the trigeminal nerve from the tumor here. This is the trigeminal, the fibrous nerve. And this is the torque rear force, the force nerve. And uh, here the SGA, caudal loop of SGA. Uh, around the brain stem. I remove the tumor supratentorial region. Here is the tentorial edge. Here, here is the entrance of the torque nerve into the tentorial cave, camera sinus. Here. From here, the trochlear now enters into the cavern sinus. Stretched petrol vein, but never sacrificed. And then I removed the tumor from the acromotor nerve, the third nerve here. This is a reliquist membrane, reliquist membrane here. I remove the tumor from the dorsum of Zera. Here is the dorsum. And uh, detach the tumor from the upper crevice. Stretched petrol vein, petrol vein, and uh, uh, fifth nerve. PCA, epilateral PCA, and contralateral PCA. I can identify both PCA and oculomotor. Yes, this is the last view. Okay, next, of course, occipital and parietal regions. Uh, also performed in the supine position, in the supine position. For the case of meningioma, in the latter half of the FARX, a working space is secured by subsidence of the cerebral hemisphere with the affected side down. And superior sagittal sinus and bridging vein, bridging vein, here, bridging vein. A cut, and here, the same position, the bridging vein, here. Okay. Next, multi-hand operation. 
Vascular anastomosis is an essential technique for the neurosurgeons, but it requires delicate manipulations that involve many types of tasks. Those are maintaining the surgical field, cleaning, suturing, replenishing consumables and equipment, and etc. many tasks. Of course, there are excellent surgeons, the grandmaster, but in order for the average surgeons to achieve comparable results, there is an option to perform operation in two or three members. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six hand, three neurosurgeons, three hand surgery. This style is useful not only for improving grace, but also rookie, rookie doctor's educational purposes. It's very good. Uh, this is a case with Moya Moya disease, Moya Moya disease, a very fine vessel, uh, obstetral artery and MCA anastomosis. Yeah. Three surgeon. Yeah. You can see the operator had not so technically superior skill, but the anastomosis, this anastomosis was still completed in a little over 10 minutes. I devoted myself to suturing and other two surgeons maintain, clean, and trim the surgical field. I believe that keeping the surgical field moist is important for improving the patency and also for the total healing. Keep wet. This scale is one millimeter, one millimeter. Oh, it's too short. I think I think it's great that we don't have to change the surgical instrument. Uh, I'm handling the forceps and the needle holder.
here. And the finished last of the ICD angiography identified the patency of the anastomosis. Yes, okay. Next, of course, there is some problem for the, uh, of course, there is no problem uh, for the aneurysm neck creeping in the anterior circulation aneurysm here. Uh, light uh, terrional keyhole approach. And this is an instrument. This is a, a creep prior for the microscopic surgery lined up for a comparison. Here, these instruments for exoscopic surgery are very short, very short. Uh, make the promise try CD angiography and uh, locate the superior cerebrum vein here. Uh, this is a uh, ipsilateral optic nerve and a contralateral optic nerve. And here is the uh, uh, interhemispheric cistern uh, recurrent artery and A1 and A2. Sharp dissection, sharp dissection. and crypt. This is not a microscope, exoscope. Uh, complete creeping, complete creeping. Here, super serial fissure is not open. This creeping is performed in a very short time of 10 minutes using the exoscope. Why was creeping possible in such a short time? This time, this time, I took the plunge, plunge and raised the patient's head quite up, quite a lot, head up. Last year, I felt the brain regressed considerably and the superior cerebral vein relaxed. Therefore, I opened only the carotid and chiasmatic and intrahemispheric cistern are bit. So I can do so fast. I will show five ALA fluorescence image, uh, three cases of agreeable stoma. Here, you can see the choroid flexus and uh, at first, it looks like a normal ependium but tumor invasion here can be detected by 5A fluorescence photography. Wow, wow. Second case, after the removal of intraparenchymal glioma totally, but 5A gave up on me, removing the entire tumor. Uh, ependymal invasion is, I can, Identify. Yes. Although it is difficult to distinguish with the naked eye, the location of the glioble so it is de depicted in the lead of five IRA. Here is a tumor, here is a normal appendium, yeah. This is the last case I today presented. This is a case of cavernous hemangioma in the medulla oblongata and uh, to cervical cord with repeated breathing in a short period. 
due to the rapid progression of quadri uh, pressure and uh, respiratory distress, I decided the surgery. The lateral approach was chosen, lateral approach, here, ventral and dorsal. I chose the lateral approach because the region is close to the surface near the anterior and posterior nerve root. Yeah. This is a cavernoma with hemangioma and the cord. Uh, I decided to invade uh, this uh, from the midline, from the midline, and rotate the medulla oblongata and cervical cone slightly uh, by gravity and traction of the pia mater and the dentate ligaments to keep the surgical field directly underneath. Here. First, rotate the bed in the lateral oblique position until it is inside the supine canal, epidural uh, management with this position. And then after craniotomy and C1 hemilaminectomy, reverse the bed to return to full lateral decubitus position. However, here there is uh, no problem with the posture of the operator. Yeah, hemodulating uh, deposition is observed. Uh, Hemilaminectomy and uh, a small craniectomy. I see the angiography. Yeah, look here. You can see. This part can be seen through in the dark here. It suggests that here is a cavernoma with hematoma just below this, just below this. Dark. So uh, inside the uh, inside the pia mater. Pia mata and enter into a medullary and the hematoma gashed out. I removed the cavernoma with hematoma piece by piece. And uh, finally, I identify no residual tumor and hematoma. And the suture the pia mater and finished. So as performing the microscopic surgery, there were some restriction on the posture of the surgeon. On the other hand, in the exoscopic surgery, the restriction patient's position are released and it becomes possible to select a more optimal position. I will perform surgery that makes the most of gravity. I chose surgery with both surgeon and the patient raising their heads, both head up surgery. Then it was inevitable to use the exoscope. And last year, I thought that microscope would co coexist for a while, but now I think that it will shift to exoscopic surgery at once in a very early time. The specialists at the top of the organization tend to miss the changes of the times. Let's return to the first question. Can you achieve same performance as microscopic surgery? Did you understand? I hope you will have next generation surgery, neurosurgery version three with an X scope. It's coming, I think.
that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Taki. Uh, thank you very much. I think you showed us a variety of very challenging cases uh, where you used uh, this exoscope. Uh, well, personally, I, I have many, many questions uh, in my head right now. <laughs> I have never used the exoscope, but I have seen uh, them. Uh, and I really think I have the feeling that this is the, the future uh, of micro neurosurgery. Um, but I will start with one question and then let uh, yeah. the, other, the other people ask you more questions. So uh, I guess you, are, uh, you, you were born like a micro neurosurgeon, right? Yeah. But I guess you had um, exposure uh, to uh, endoscopic surgery, yeah. right? So uh, my question is, um, how, how steep the learning curve uh, is for the use of the exoscope? Because my feeling is, if a surgeon has only microsurgery experience, uh, that would be very hard for this surgeon to switch to exoscope. But if I think about myself, I was exposed to uh, endoscopic surgery. Probably uh, I am more comfortable uh, working and looking at the screen. So uh, wh what's your feeling about this? Thank you. Sir. Thank you, your question. Uh, you, you are right. Uh, but it's no trouble for the uh, rookies. A younger, younger neurosurgeon has no problems. But the uh, surgeon, neurosurgeon who masters the micro neurosurgery it is very difficult for the first time. I, I think, let me show you a few more. Um, I, I think it takes some getting used to 20 to 30 times to use. Mm. Uh, so it is okay. very uh, difficult for the uh, master of the neurosurgery. Right. OK, thank you very much. I think we are running out of time and we have to move ahead with the following speech. Maybe we can have, uh, uh, if uh, Raja agrees and you agree, uh, we can have a more deep discussion after the second talk. <laughs> yeah, I think that would be more appropriate. Okay. So I, I would like to ask Professor Lu Meiking to uh, show us your, your presentation, please. OK. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, join and uh, join the ASCNS and give my presentations. So here, um, um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see. Yes. Okay. Uh, my topic is achieving therapeutic levels of GH by open and endoscopic surgery in growth hormone adenomas. I'm from Shanghai General Hospital. Uh, as you know, particular adenoma is a very common uh, intracranial tumors. It's approximately 16.7% of the primary intracranial tumor. Some particular adenomas uh, can be invasive, categorized as NOSP3 or NOSP4, which invade the neighboring structure, including the dura, bone of the scalpis, and even encapsulating ICA and compressing optic nerve. The invasive GHP uh, particular adenoma can cause complications of multiple system, including the endocrine, cardiovascular, and the GI. Patients' quality of life and the lifespan are decreased. These invasive tumors tend to have larger size 
and are, are difficult to achieve. Total resection. Uh, most of them are refractory. Uh, by chemical remission, for this category of the tumor is one of the most difficult parts in managing refractory uh, PA. Uh, the patient with acromegaly have three to eight fold increased risk of getting a colonal cancer or neoplastic polys. Acromegaly decreased life expectancy significantly. Multiple studies reveal that the death of the rate of acromegaly is two to 14 times greater than health population. Cardiovascular disease and the malignant tumors comprise most of the <coughs> comprise most of the premature uh, deaths. In order to prevent and reward the associated cardiovascular complication, we need to lower the sodium uh, GH level to less than 2.5 nanogram uh, per milliliter, especially for young patients. So this is our protocol. If we find the typical uh, acromegaly or suspected acromegaly, we have a laboratory test of the GH, IGF-1, and OGTT uh, test. And then, uh, then we will evaluate the complications uh, if he uh, suffered <coughs> a cardio uh, cardiovascular or respiratory or serious complications. If he has a conjure induction of anesthesia or surgery. If he has, we will first have the medical therapy. And then, uh, and then after uh, his symptoms improved, we will uh, do the operations. And if, if he is no uh, complications, so we will do the operations immediately and, uh, and then uh, have a follow-up. And between, uh, if the, after the operations, there is no remission. And also the radio therapy is also alternative. So the most, uh, so most cases of acromegaly will use the surgery and the medical therapy combined, they will help each other. So uh, the, the management and the follow-up of acromegaly, and the, the destination is we do the treatment is a tumor resection and the biochemical remissions. The biochemical remissions, the baseline, the GH is less than 2.5 nanogram per milliliter, or in OGTT test should give uh, less than one nanogram per milliliter. And the new addition, uh, if we can achieve 0 0.4 nanogram per milliliter, uh, the complications of the patient uh, they will uh, not occur. So it is very important for the patient to have the biochemical remissions. So uh, combined, the main therapy is a surgery, med medical therapy, and a radio therapy. And uh, for each patient, we will follow up the lifetime. So how about the surgical therapy of the benefit of the surgical therapy? Uh, it, it can be it can relieve the mass effect, decrease the tumor size, which yields better responses, saveness to the adjunctive medical therapy and the radio therapy. And the surgery is the mainstay treatment choice for most growth hormone particular adenomas. So uh, 
the surgical resection remains one of the most effective treatment modalities. Uh, for example, the patient, the tumors invading the cavernous sinus or uh, is growth with the supercellar or the clavicular extensions or some invasive macroadenomas and the patient with pre-operation GH more than 15 nanogram per milliliter in spite of the possibility of the residue tumors and the persistent GH levels. So uh, my personal experience of this technique to do the operation is uh, so first is very important to careful review the image studies before the operation. It can help us understand the growth corridor, the tumor growth corridor, and then we can choose the surgical route and the resection strategies. If the tumor growth is limited within the intracellular or supercellular regions, the uh, we, the priority is endoscopic approach. If the tumor's invasion without breaks through the cavernous sinus, we are also use endoscopic surgery. If the tumor's breaks through the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus or breaks through the ocular mode triangular of the cavernous sinus, we use the, the tolerance approach. So this, uh, this picture is a withdrawal. Uh, how about the tumors? When the tumor grows, the whole uh, covenant sinus is expanded uh, from uh, every direction, from the uh, intracellular uh, to the superior, uh, superior triangular of the tumor and the lateral triangular of the uh, covenant sinus and the posterior surface. So uh, when the tumor uh, breaks through the covenant sinus, here the tumors uh, can break through the triocular mode triangular and the lateral uh, from the Parkinson triangular and also from here to in see, uh, to see the triangular cavernous sinus triangular and uh, pos posterior triangular here. So uh, for example, this is the navigation systems should, should us if the tumors is brought to the basilar gangrene from here and, uh, and from, from we, we have the depicted the lesions we can find out the tumor is approached from the uh, ocular mode triangular, just along the ocular mode nerve. And if we remove this kind of the tumor, uh, if the tumor is soft, we can, we can uh, remove these tumors by the endoscopic surgery uh, from the medial, medial approach. As if the tumor is approached to the posterior surface of the cavernous sinus, the tumors will compress the particle of the metabrain, metabrain just like this, this case, and the tumor is through this way, and the, we, would, we would choose the different approach to remove this kind of, the, this part of the tumors. And uh, in this case, all three types of the uh, tumor's growth breaks through the covenant sinus. We can see here different, this part of the tumors is going to the, is going to the pedancle, pedancle compress, compress, compress the pedancle and uh, it shows the tumor is breaks through the posterior triangular of the cavernous sinus. So here is a clinical data. 
of our serious case of, about the growth hormone pituitary adenomas patient in our centers. And in pathologically, the seven cases uh, of the tumor is GH plus PRL. And uh, NOSP grade four, is there, there are 18 cases. And the NOSP grade three of the five cases and the tumor as a diameter more than three centimeters, there are 15 cases. And uh, there are eight cases and between two and three. And also they are uh, biologically invasive cases, uh, such as a KI67 is more than, more than four and uh, the immunohistologically, the PIT is positive and the P53 uh, is positive. This shows the tumor uh, is uh, like, like some water, the malignant and uh, invasive. This kind of tumor uh, will invading the bone and the dura of the clivus and the neighboring structures and uh, it is easy to recur. So how, how we select the right approach to different kinds of these uh, implicated uh, particular adenomas. So this is the principles. If the tumors is anterior or superior cellular uh, extensions, the endoscopic uh, surgery we are first choice. If the tumors uh, in the anterior posterior of the clotted artery is a cavernous sinus, so we are also use the endoscopic uh, approach. If the tumor is a protrude uh, to the ocular mode triangular and uh, also the tumor is tough, we are use the tolerance approach. If the tumor Execute to the lateral growth, uh, lateral uh, breakthrough, we are using a tolerance approach. And, and if the tumor is a superior lateral approach to the clinoid space, we, are, we also use the tolerance approach. So here, uh, <coughs> if the tumors, this is a brief, uh, this is a brief uh, scheme shows if the tumor is intruded from here, we are using endoscopic uh, surgery. If the tumor is going to the lateral, we are using this approach. If the tumor is uh, invading uh, lateral to the anterior process, uh, we are using tolerance approach. Uh, so, uh, in short, we, if, we, if we use endoscopic uh, surgery, the tumors is the, the anterior and the lower uh, between, uh, lower from the horizontal, horizontal uh, clotted artery, we we'll use this approach. If the tumor to, is protruded to the ocular mode, if the tumor is soft, we are also use the endoscopic surgery, but if the tumor is hard, uh, we will use the tolerance approach. If the tumor go to the pedicle, pedicle breaks through the cavernous sinus, it's also we can use the endoscopic surgery or the tolerance approach. So, main uh, main uh, GH uh, GH particular adenomas, uh, when we use the uh, medical therapy, like the ultracide, ultratide, uh, several times the tumor will become harder. So it is very difficult for them uh, to remove, to remove from the endoscopic surgery uh, when they invaded into the cavernous sinus. So, we will, in, in this case, we will use the modified tolerance approach. First, uh, we will remove the optic 
uh, the anterior clinoid process and uh, open the optic canal, then we will peel the outer layer, uh, outer layer of dura from the superior orbital fissure. Then uh, the forum lighting, from forum lighting. Then uh, after that, we will open the dura, uh, open the clotted ring, the pestle clotted ring, and uh, uh, and then uh, combine the epidural and subdural together. Uh, together, then we will show the uh, the tumor, uh, the supercellular, intracellular, and uh, the tumor in the covenant sinus. They will combine together. Then we will remove the tumors. So here, this uh, is the first case. We I'd like to show this case. Uh, the first case. This case is a male, uh, 49 years old. He was present with a typical signs of acromegaly and uh, causing of the facial feature and the darkly skin texture, texture for two months. The patient's family is also complains of his loud snoring during sleep and excessive daytime sleepiness. And uh, laboratory test reveals the GH is very high. And the MRI shows a two centimeters cell mass. This is uh, before the operations. So the tumors is invaded in the cavernous sinus and uh, encapsulates the uh, clotted artery. So this is NOSP4, NOSP4 uh, particular adenoma. According to our principle, we will use endoscopic surgery. This, this uh, is the image. And we also use a OGTT test before the operations. And the GH is uh, very high. And uh, because this patient is at high risk for the surgical therapy, to relieve the symptoms, we are first prescribed with the archetype uh, 30 milligrams uh, uh, inch muscular. After three days, uh, his symptoms is uh, improved. Improved. Then we proceed to transphenoidal particular adenoma removal. Here, this is the case. Uh, I will show very quickly. So this uh, is open, open the sphenoidal. So this, this is the part of the tumors. to remove the resident tumors. Uh, and then we make a suture for the cell. And uh, this is uh, the post-operation laboratory test. We can see the G growth hormone level is going is going down, and uh, <coughs> it is become GH and uh, PR uh, GH is uh, become become normal. This is a post operations. We can see the movies, and the tumors yeah, has been removed. And he also shows PIT is positive. And this is the second case. 
this uh, this uh, patient is a female. She is only twenty four years old and visual loss and oligomonorrhea for two years. And the GH is very high, and he was pre prescribed with ultratight uh, sodium sodium micrograms uh, intramuscular. <coughs> And the tumor is very large, and he's encased as a carotid artery, and also grows to the supercellular, and then go into the third ventricle. So in this case, it's very difficult to remove this kind of the tumors. So we planned. This case is very difficult. So how can we remove, totally remove the tumors and uh, uh, to get the therapeutic levels of the growth hormone? So uh, after we discuss, we, uh, we plan to have a two stage. As the first, first we will chance uh, in the nasal approach uh, to remove the tumors. To remove the tumors uh, from the intracellular and the supercellular. But uh, the tumors in the third ventricle uh, is very difficult to totally remove it. So uh, the first stage we we just uh, remove the intracellular and the supercellular. Then after them, uh, after them, we wait for several months to let the resident tumors uh, go in down. Uh, this is uh, 10 days after the operations. We can see here, uh, except the third nerve, the, the tumors is the third nerve, the other tumors ha has been removed. You can see here. So the GH is going down, but the IGF-1 is also higher. So after, after eight months later, uh, we followed up this patient and he he um, admitted to the hospital again to the second resections. This part of the tumor is going down. So we remove we remove this kind of the, the tumors. You can see here this is a third uh, ventricle under the tumors. Uh, here has been removed. And then, <clears throat> the after the operations, the tumors here has been removed. So, how about his uh, uh, the image here? And after the operation, the tumor has been removed. So after six months, there is no tumor resident. So we, how about his GH level? Um, <clears throat> before the operation, the after the first operations, and then after the second operations, he is going going down and become normal. This is IGF one. It's become normal, and. Uh, the patient 
the KI67 is very high. So this patient is also needs further uh, chemotherapy or the others. But the patient is very young, uh, very young. Uh, he, we just follow up the observation uh, and his appearance is improved and become uh, totally normal. And here, this is another case of the male. This patient is uh, 35 years old and he has been used medical therapy for six calls uh, and uh, he had uh, undergoing, underwent uh, three operations. So the patient is, the uh, tumor test use is very hard and uh, 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 transsphenoid surgery twice. And the tumor breaks loose ocular mode, triangular and Parkinson uh, disease. Parkinson triangular. You can see here, this is the resident tumors. This part of the tumor uh, is uh, breaks through the ocular mode triangular. And here is breaks through the uh, Parkinson, uh, Parkinson triangular. So we do this, uh, we do this patient use the tolerance approach. Because the tumor is too hard, tumor testing is very hard. So first we remove the anterior, anterior uh, clinoid process. Then open the tumor. Then uh, we we are cut the fold ligament and uh, peel away the outer layer, uh, outer layer of the dura to show the epidural space uh, in the cavernous sinus. So here we can find the tumor here and. Uh, this is a lateral cavernous sinus. This is a superior cavernous sinus. So you can see here, the tumor is very hard. The tumor tissue is hard. So it is very difficult to remove this kind of the tumor in, uh, in through the endoscopic technique. This is a lateral, uh, lateral uh, cavernous sinus. So we open the superior cavernous sinus to remove this part of the tumors. The tumors is also uh, invaded in the interdura of the superior uh, triangular. and remove the tumors piece by piece, and then connect it to the lateral triangular and the superior triangular. Through these manip manipulations, the tumor has uh, removed. So after tumor removal, you can see here, this is the ocular mode, ocular mode nerve. This is diaphragm dures. This is the clotted artery. But as after the operations, uh, he's uh, his growth hormone can to totally re remission, haven't totally remissions.
uh, here, this is the post operation. So you can see here the tumor has been removed. We'll still follow up as this patient. Uh, I'd, I'd like to show the, uh, five, the case five. This case is very interesting. He is, she is 30 uh, years old female and uh, present with the oligomonorrhea and uh, weight gain for 10 months. He had been uh, underwent transsphenoidal particular adenoma uh, removal uh, post operations for three months. Uh, she was performed transsphenoidal removal at another hospital. And uh, after the operations, the pathological re revealed the GH uh, particular adenoma is KI, KI 70, 70, uh, 67, 10%, and the GH and the PIL, so it's positive. And also he is having the medical therapy for uh, three months, but the GH level is also higher, still higher. <coughs> She's unmarried. <coughs> so you can see this patient, uh, his, uh, she's tumor, her tumor is a very uh, stranger. Uh, most of the tumors is in the cavernous sinus, and a part of them is uh, in the supercellular. Uh, you can see here the tumors is in the lateral, lateral, and uh, uh, in case the clotted artery. So it's a very difficult to do the operations through the endoscopic surgery. So we use the Dolan's approach to remove these tumors. First, we are remove the clinoid, pro clinoid process. After remove the clinoid process, uh, we find the tumors Uh, and we we open the dura and combine the epidural space uh, to the subedular space. Here is remove remove the uh, anterior uh, the uh, anterior medial triangular. And we find the tumor. And first, we will remove the supercellular tumors. And then uh, we remove the intracellular, uh, intracellular tumors. Then after that, we are open the cavernous sinus. You can see here very clear, this is clotted artery, this is horizontal clotted artery and uh, here uh, is the anterior curve of the clotted artery. So the, uh, the tumors surrounded the clotted artery with weak exposure, exposure 360 degrees. So uh, after these manipulations, the tumor has been removed. So uh, 
this is the image post operations. So in the image, we can see the tumors surrounded the clotted artery has been removed. And uh, uh, how about the GH levels? So uh, this, uh, this is the GH, uh, GH values. We can see the GH levels is become lower and lower. And uh, we follow up this patient. And uh, uh, the pathological issues, the KI 67, PIT, and, and the P43 are positive. So, so these tumors has a biologically invasive. We also follow up this patient. This is a, uh, the patient, uh, he does the OGTT test uh, by, by herself. He shows the GH levels is a become lower and lower. He tested every three months, every three months. So, the GH level is a become uh, the lower GH is become uh, 1.06 nanogram per milliliters. It's uh, it's uh, it's very uh, interesting, and uh, his glucose is a become uh, become normal and become normal. This is the last last case. This is the last case. You can see this patient is very difficult. So I asked the patient uh, if he want to do the endoscopic surgery or to do the open the surgery. Uh, if we do the endoscopic surgery, we may do we have a two phase. But if we uh, use the open surgery, may we have only one time. So he choose the open surgery. We also use the uh, Dolan's approach. Here, this is uh, after the operations, the image. You can see here the tumor has been removed. How about his levels? You can see here the GH level is become normal, become normal. So she, uh, he is very great, uh, uh, very glad. So, uh, and the last, uh, some take home message. Uh, I think it is a very difficult. Uh, it is, is a very difficult for invasive growth hormone, particularly adenomas. So careful study uh, the imaging before the operation is very important. If we understand the tumor growth corridor, we can choose the uh, the best uh, approach to do the uh, operations. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Meiking, for this very beautiful presentation and congratulations for your drawings, very clear and explicative drawings. Uh, so I, I ask uh, Raja if we have time for one question or a couple yes, of sir, We'll give five minutes. <laughs> we have only five minutes. Oh, so ask, can I ask a question? Yes, Professor Susikshan, definitely. Uh, nice to see you all. And, uh, you know, there's so many other meetings are going on. Well, it's an excellent talk. But, you know, uh, I uh, what I people are telling is, uh, even for a microadenoma, uh, we, we, without even invasiveness to the cavernous sinus, the medial wall of the cavernous sinus is invariably involved. That is what is nearly 100% of GH secreting aneroma. So it is mandatory that the surgeon makes all effort to remove the medial wall of the cavernous sinus, not only for nos invasive ones, even for grade one, even for grade zero also, because the venous drainage through the uh, medial wall is quite common and invasion is common, medial wall. So my question to Professor is, uh, uh, through Dolan's approach, it is very difficult to remove the medial wall of the cavernous sinus. Uh, so how do you address the removal of the medial wall of the cavernous sinus? First question. Now, second question is, instead of doing Dolan's approach, 
one can do a extensive synodotomy expose not only the cell but also anterior wall of the cavernous sinus anterior wall of the cavernous sinus is formed by periosteal dura and it can be easily separated from the medial wall of the cavernous sinus which is formed by the meningeal dura it is just like a, a dolong approach only you can do that separation through endoscope once you separate the remove the decompress the tumor from the cell you can go to the cavernous sinus part there are so many ligaments attached to the internal carotid artery and from the medial wall you can detether them sequentially and remove the medial wall also this is just from miranda group from uh, stanford the videos are there beautifully and it is written how to remove it and lastly to a question to the uh, professor is after removing uh, nicely this tumors when uh, when do you advise uh, oral glucose tolerance then thank you professor sorry shina uh, i have, i think I, there are many questions for professor making uh, if you want to answer uh, if we want to remove the tumors in the media uh video wall of the cavernous sinus we use the endoscopic surgery we do not use the dolens approach we will follow up uh, in first uh, uh, every month we will telephone him ask him ask him to our hospital in the outpatient to uh, have the OGTP test uh, after three months we will follow this patient every three months every three months Every three months to our outpatient to have the OGTT test. If he is uh, far away from our hospital, he can have the OGTT test in his local hospital. Then we will telephone her or telephone him. He will uh, give us his result. We have uh, a special uh, uh, a faculty to follow up uh, every patient uh, through our hospital, especially for the uh, GH uh, particular adenomas. Thank you very much. Way out of time. So yeah. probably we have to thank both our guests, uh, Professor Taki and Professor Meiking for really inspiring and wonderful lectures. Raja, you want to yeah, definitely close this officially on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the uh, President Professor Yoko Gata, I would like to sincerely thank today's speakers, Professor Taku Taki and Professor Lumi King and also my dear friend Professor Alberto Felitti from Italy for joining us today and giving such a wonderful insights into this uh, very novel techniques of uh, exoscope as well as uh, mastercraft in GH adenomas. Thank you so much, all the attendees who joined. Due to lack of time, we could not interact today with you. Definitely in future, we shall look into it. Thank you, my dear friend Liu Boon Singh from Malaysia, who is my co host for today. And thank you, Professor Zubin, who has a tremendous support from China. He is broadcasting these lectures and translating into Chinese. We are so thankful. We have no words to describe our gratitude to Professor Zubin. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for organizing such a wonderful uh, webinar. Yeah, uh, this time uh, around um, maybe 1,500 audience in the WeChat channel. Wow. See the broadcast of the webinar. Chinese numbers. Yeah. Chinese numbers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. These are huge numbers. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. You are really indebted to. So until next Saturday, it is bye-bye from all of us.